So when God's speaking to you, don't ask him to stop. And if it seems like it's too much, ask him to open your heart, the floodgates. I love that, Antoinette. Open the floodgates of our hearts to receive more so that we can walk in a greater way with him. So again, Charlotte, the comments are working great. So thank you, God, for that. And forgive the guy on this side of the camera with the technical issues trying to figure it out. I even wrote Periscope about it, trying to get it figured out. So uh, Olivia, Alvia, Olivia, Olivier. <laughs> now I can't even say your name right, right? Uh, Olivier, it's so good to have you here. Beverly Sue, welcome. I think I've greeted uh, the rest of you. So revival, we're talking about revival. In revival, we're speaking of a true, vital, necessary relationship with God where we're walking in light and not in darkness. When we're honest with ourselves, we're in a world surrounded by darkness. And in Christianity today, we've become very soft on the truth. Do you know what I'm saying? In other words, we don't say, thus says the Lord so often. This is what the word says. This is what's true. We kind of butter it up, water it down, and then we wonder when we go to God why we get the same kind of results. We aren't seeing the results produced that God has promised because we water it down. Katie, good morning. I think all the chat's fixed here. Anne, so great to have you here. So do, when we want, you take a drink, you water it down. And the word speaks of, the Bible speaks of people that water down the word. And there would be tavern owners. This is considered an old thing, but it probably happens today. Tavern owners that would dilute the drink so they can increase their profits. Right. Holy Spirit, yes. It's way too soft. Now, I'm not talking about have, live life, live love. Yes. Talking about having a hard heart toward people. No. Because how can you receive God's tender compassion and return that to him and give it out to others if your heart is hard? Can't happen. So what we're speaking about is having a tender, compassionate heart, but carrying the truth of the word that we don't back it down. I remember an incident. It was with a gentleman. We were in a fellowship and some things came up. And that's the gentleman speaking to this other person of what they were saying, the abundance of the heart of what they were spewing, what was coming out of their mouth, they were spewing out. He goes, well, this is a simple answer, he says. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And what you're telling me is you're not trusting in the Lord with all your heart. If we could just say that to people, as I have said before, in cases where I had a poverty mentality, or I remember there was another one. Uh, I remember... I had something going in my mind with another person. And I was speaking things that were like the word, but they were mixed and diluted. And this person caught it, thank God, and they came to me and spoke to me and said, you know, this sounds really spiritual, but something isn't right. And I was, by the Spirit of God, I was able to recognize the truth in what he was saying, and it got me back on course. We need one another to help one another stay on course. If you let go of your, does it really matter what, it, what matters? How about Trump, Pence, trumpets, whatever. Does it really matter what I think about Trump at the moment? Moment, But I thank God. I pray for him. I thank for his family, the cabinet, the people he's electing. You're asking me about Trump and what God is going to be doing through that man in our country. But if we, if we as individuals don't stand for the truth, our country still goes into captivity. We're not looking to a man unless that man be the Lord from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, to our God for our sufficiency, our supply, and this is the way, walk in it with him. So this is part seven and it's revival. And again, it's out of order because I would like to do this other part and I don't know how the timing is going to fit. I don't know if I'm going to do two parts on Friday because we do the broadcast in the morning, the healing broadcast primarily, maybe one at night or in later in the day because we've got other places to be. We'll just see what happens. Hey, if the Lord returns, does it really matter? So, and I already said Monday, probably unlikely for a broadcast, unless I have a good signal and want to do an on the road one, right? So revival, revival, where the word of God becomes living and true, always starts with the individual. It doesn't start with the group. One person on fire for God can change a nation. 
And we know that from the scriptures. The one man, the apostle Paul, even now, the, 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 the rising up of the word in his life, the living of the light that was in him and the truth affected, affects us today. Do we understand that? A camera. A camera takes an image and it only takes a moment of light, a brief moment, a brief part of a second for the photons, the light, right, to hit, used to be the film, but now the digital sensors, the sensors that are in there, it only takes a moment to make an impact that makes in a picture for, in a sense, eternity. It only takes a moment of contact with God that when we stand on the truth, we speak it and we walk it out that can actually change our homes, what's going on in our families, our children, whoever, our neighborhoods, our neighbors, uh, our city, our nation. A moment of piercing truth, loving light from our Father can change a nation. And that's really what Ezekiel is about when he's in captivity, but we're not going there because I don't have that ready. So I'm looking, I want to do, I would like to do this revival in two parts. So part seven, it's almost like a part seven A and a part seven B. Welcome to you from Sweden. So good to have you here. And for your uh, name, you have like girly faces, so I can't put a name to it. All right. And I'm not always that good a name. Yes. That... Yes, he was on fire for God, and there are many today on fire for God. Will we come in alignment with the truth, even though it sometimes uh, it's purifying, and purifying means there's like some straining, there's some friction. We've talked about this. We've considered this a number of times, where we come in alignment with our Father. If we want to see the great work of God in our life, look, if you want to see the great work of God, it has to start with you and I. If we're waiting for someone else to do it, you're going to be waiting a whole heck of a long time. So it begins with us, and it's our focus on God and our response to his working within us. When he speaks, do we listen? When he speaks, do we answer? And when he speaks, do we speak forth what he's speaking? Do we listen? Do we answer? And do we speak forth what he is speaking? Makes all the difference and whether revival is living and real in us. Look at people you know that have heard the word of God time after time. They've heard truth, life freeing truth that breaks captivity and puts them into an understanding of who they are created to be in Christ. And yet their lives are very mediocre. They're neutral on the things of the world and they never stand, really stand for truth. And they are crying out to God, God, why aren't you doing something? And he goes, I sent you. What are you doing with what I gave you? It's like setting a buffet in front of a person, the buffet of the kingdom and his promises. And you sit there and say, God, feed me. And he says, I've put the food in front of you. Start feeding yourself and receiving the nourishment of my life. All right? So here we go. I have great expectations for this part. Amy, let's go for it. So this is going to be a primarily scriptural thing. And you might think I'd just go through Acts and show the revival and how the word moved and how mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. If I remember, there's five statements. Now, nah, maybe I'm thinking of something else. But there's a number of statements of how the word of God mightily grew and prevailed through the book of Acts. And Acts is about revival. But it's about individuals, not only apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors, but individual believers, disciples of the Lord, disciplining themselves in the ways of God and giving that life out to others. That's why we're here today, so that we give out the life that is given to us from our Father to our world. So, Renee, so such a blessing to have you here. So, again, this is like part 7A, even though I labeled it part 7. So, and I'm going at it a different angle than you might expect. The Lord give us insight into his understanding and his heart. So, I'm in John 21, 19, part, the last half of the verse. We say B sometimes, right? If we broke it into three parts, we say A, B, and C. I don't know. The latter part of the verse through 22. John 21, 19, the latter part through 22. Patty, uh, in the Midwest, good morning here. So when he had spoken, he saith unto them, follow me. This is Jesus speaking to Peter 
And he's telling Peter, this is after, remember he says, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And he goes, you know I love you, Lord. But he, the Lord doesn't stop there with Peter. He asked him what? Three times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. The heart, the, one of the hearts of this is it's like, feed the women the word, feed the young people the word, and feed the mature men my word. That's one perspective of this. Uh, there are other perspectives, but the truth is Christ is endeavoring to get to his heart because even though Peter loves Jesus Christ, is he really at the place sold out where he needs to be, or is he coming into that place? So when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter said, turning around, and he sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Now, who is the disciple who lays his head on Jesus' breast at the uh, Last Supper, the Last Dinner, and uh, was the one that Jesus loved? Who was it? Who knows who that is? So I'm going to wait and see if someone can put that in the chat here. So, John. It's John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know, the, the delay doesn't seem so long today. That makes me feel good because my mind like, okay, is it going out? Right. So anyway, John, the, the beloved, now the one that writes the book of Revelation. There's something too unique to understand. For Why don't you send your question, either wait to the end, I would ask, or send your question. Someone's asking a question here, Facebook, those are on Facebook. And Amy, I see that. John, absolutely. Why don't you send your question to me? My information is in the bio. And I'm going to tell you the truth here. Most people will not stay around for the answer because they just want to hear whatever anybody has to say. And the other point of it is, when I ask people, and I'm speaking into this, when people say they have a question for me, they rarely write me. Rarely. One in 10, one in 20 will write me because you know what? You're just in here to make noise sometimes and not really searching for an answer. Well, what's that person's opinion? What's that person's opinion? Look, we can go down the street and get a lot of opinions on any subject. I want God's truth that sets me free, that will free others. I don't want the opinions of men and of myself. I don't even want my own opinions. I want the truth of the word that breaks darkness from light and sets me free, and we set captives free. Yesterday, we're moving into this John 21 here. Yesterday, we were out in a town ministering, and there was a lady that, as I understand, as we were ministering to her, and actually, I was there, it was Robert and Patty, and they were ministering to this lady. She had a sciatic nerve issue, such a joyful lady. She had a sciatic nerve issue, and it was bothering her, and after some a minute of ministry, or whatever, 30 seconds, I don't know, she was better. And then uh, Patty got involved, and she got the lady's mind off the thing, and we're just letting God work, and she was totally set free. Her sciatic nerve was totally healed. We had a person with a knee that saw some deliverance. Uh, there was a group of ladies I was ministering to that were very touched by the Spirit of God and the things he was, you know, over their bodies and their lives and things. And then there was, uh, there was a guy... Uh, Christopher, Chris, Chris, who had heart problems. He had an irregular heartbeat and all. And he felt, I just put my hand on his chest and spoke over his heart, a normal rhythm. And he felt the warmth of the, you know, God moving. And he felt a change physically in his body. Now I said, you got to go to the doctor and see what your doctor says. Because I don't, you know, I don't have the stethoscope. I'm going to check your beat. But I said, God has done the change that you've requested in your heart and things are working normally because that's what we declare. We declare life over people. So we had a number of wonderful, simple healings and deliverances yesterday as we were out ministering life. We were about our Father's business. What are we doing with what he has for us to do? Okay, so he said, what about the one Jesus loved, right? Peter turning sees the disciple whom Jesus loved. John, that's already answered, you've already answered that. And, geez, I got so much in my mind in this. God loves everyone equally. Do you think that Jesus, who always did the Father's well, will loved equally? Yes. But it's the ones who are more receptive to the Father's love that can receive more. Do you understand that? It's like a plant. A sunflower will turn to the sun in the morning and turn in the day 
to keep facing the sun. But there are actual flowers that even go to the extent of hiding behind leaves and things because they don't want the fullness of the light or plants that, you know, they grow in shade, right? So that's dealing with the Father's love. We can just track with Him, His heart, His love, His compassion all day, or we can just take it for a moment and go on. It's our choice. Uh, moonflowers, there you go, moonflowers. I'm not familiar with them, but they, they, I guess they like the light of the moon then. So uh, we can be like John who tracked the love that Jesus was releasing, or we can be like the others. They were in and they were out. They were in and they're out, okay? It is our choice. Uh... <laughs> Greg, good morning. You give out the trophies every time you speak. Thank you, brother. Good to have you stop by for a moment. You are loved. You are amazing. Thank you all for the hearts and the shares. Okay, back on point. John 21. So he leaned on the breast at his supper, which also leaned on his breast at supper, Jesus' breast, right? And said, Lord, who is he that betrayeth thee? Now, the subject doesn't even go there. It changes all of a sudden. Peter, seeing him, John, says, Jesus... Lord, what shall this man do? In other words, what's John going to do with his life? He was more concerned what was, because Jesus already spoke to him, right? He said, if you love me, feed my sheep, right? Feed my lamb, so forth. But feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Do you love me? But P Peter now has got his focus off what God is, what's being revealed to him through Jesus Christ. And he's more concerned about, well, what's John going to do? What's he doing? Right? We're left here with our Lord. So, um, he says, Jesus said unto him, if, if I will that he tarries till I come, what is that to thee? Follow, you follow me, follow thou me. In other words, look, Peter, let me work with John. Let me work with the others. What I'm concerned about is your relationship with me. If you are more concerned about what others are doing in their walks than what you're doing with your father and being in harmony, alignment, in, in the sweet music of his presence, then we're not going to carry out the plan he has for us in any great degree. This is what revival is about. We're keeping our head and our heart, our whole being, trusting in him, looking to him, seeking him we're not seeking what others are doing what's the preacher down the street doing what's the church down the street doing what's my neighbor doing is that our focus it's not on what others are doing it's on our god and our lord and what they would have us to do that's a vital key to when revival becomes real first timothy 2 1 through 5 so this is a section we've looked at at least one or two verses in here a number of times. I encourage or exhort, therefore, that first of all, prayers, supplications, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. It doesn't say, go check and see if your neighbor's doing their prayers today, does it? Hey, it's my job to do my prayers, right, to go to God. It's my my heart to seek Him. It's my privilege to enter into this relationship uh, and not just regurgitate something. I'm not sure how you're going with that. Be regurgitate something, but to come into a relationship where we're having the freshness, I like the dew of the morning. I love that, the sweet music of his presence. Yeah, which I, that's what I said, but I like the way you put it, so thank you. <laughs> um, let's see, we're just gonna say goodbye. All right, I just, you just have to block people. If you're just gonna, if you wanna come in here, and receive what's here, praise God. If it's not what appeals to you, it doesn't interest you, why hang out? But I'm thankful if you hang out because sometimes maybe God might speak something to you that will change the course of your life forever. That's what we want to do. We want to change the course of our lives forever that it impacts, affects others to have a change forever. Right, Renee? So, so good. Thank you. All right. So, Giving a thanks be made for all men, not some, not the ones I choose, not the ones I love, just the ones I like, for all men, for, for all in authority, right? He says kings here because they didn't have presidents. We all need a touch from God. And you know what? 
God has a touch available daily to each of us daily. I used to think that, man, God, you showed favor to this person. You did this and you did that person. You did that and you do all these amazing things. And I like, I maybe get it once every six months or a year. And I'm like, I finally realized I was being like Peter and looking at what others are doing instead of being in my relationship with my father, ask, seeking, and knocking what he has for me. And now every day, God does something in my life that is mind-blowing. And if I sit here and go through the things he does, a few, just three or four or five days, the healings yesterday, the incredible ministry of the word that he was speaking to us and we were considering. And as I walk forth, I just recognize his presence is with me and the things he's doing and the people that call me and the people step into a relationship where we're coming closer to God and things that are just supernatural. It's like, and it was never because I was good going to be good enough to receive it. You or I can't be good enough. It's the goodness of God in Christ that releases everything to us. And we got to quit looking at others and enter into the relationship he has for us and then you'll never want to be anybody else. Everybody, I want to be, I remember when I wanted to be like my older brother. Man, he had a motorcycle shop, thought he had it really together. You know, in that stage of my life, I thought he had it all. So I want to be like my older brother. So you ever wanted to be like someone else? Put a one in the chat room if you want on Periscope. So put a one in there if you ever wanted to be like someone else. Well, the only person, there's only one person to be like. Yes, Danielle. That and welcome CSAM098 on your first day, Charlotte, Danielle. There's only one person that you want to be like, and that's our Lord and our Savior, our life giver. Savior means life giver. Uh, Christ means Messiah, the one who releases life. We want to be like God. We want to be like our Christ, Yeshua. Yes. So, woo. And it says in this 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5, the prayers, the intercessions, giving a thanks for all men. It doesn't say cursing them. It doesn't say putting them down. Why do we speak in our closets blessings? And if we go out and give bitter water, what is it, James? How can sweet water and bitter water come forth? Now, I'm not denying truth of what it is. You remember Jesus called Herod. He said, that old fox, <laughs> right? That cunning, deceitful dude, right? But you know what? I'll bet when all the records are there, come forth, he prayed for Herod. Think about that, because this is something that's coming forth by revelation of Jesus Christ to Paul. And if I, Christ did not give people things to do that he didn't do himself, I think you get that. So for kings, all their authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, in his presence, his sight, God our Savior. See, God is our life giver, our Savior. Christ is our life giver. God is the author of life. So he's the life giver. But the method which he carries it out is through Jesus Christ who presents, has brought us salvation's plan. You see that? God is the source of giving life. But through Christ is how he presents that life to us. So they're both Life givers in agreement. I and the Father are one. I only do what I see my Father doing. I came not to do my own will, but the will of the Father. So much to learn. And it's like we could be here all day, right? We could just be. And that's the greatness. When you're in with a good group of believers, you're talking about the word. You're not talking about politics. You're not talking about all the junk in the world. You're talking about the word. Look, when those two boys were on the road to the Emmaus, they did. You know, they were concerned that the one they thought was going to deliver Israel, the prophet, mighty in word and deed. They were like, "Tell us about that." And Facebook is having issues and going down, so it's coming back. So Facebook, if it drops, I apologize. It's showing issues there. Let me, I'll do one thing here that might help that drop a signal here. Okay, so God through his son brings the life, the giving of life to us that we so needed and we so lack. You know, it's like speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is perfect prayer. You can't enter in with selfish prayers because perfect prayer doesn't have that. And so God, and it says that in our need, he came through. 
and I don't remember exactly how it's written in, I believe, Romans 8, but it speaks with groanings that cannot be uttered. In other words, by our natural ability, our natural man, we cannot even go as deep in our prayer life as we can when we pray in the Spirit, we sing in the Spirit, and so forth. All right, and God is designed, God is spirit, and he's seeking, seeking them that will worship him in spirit and truth, truly by the spirit, but it also, because he, in that relationship, Jesus Christ says they will be known by our love, but God says, you know, the word says to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So is our mind, in this whole thing, like the sunflower and all these things we're bringing up, isn't our mind to come in alignment with him, with his thoughts, so that the Christ mind is living within us? Absolutely. Bam to boom. So, in the sight of God, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, who have all men to be saved, to come to a knowledge of the truth, for there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, I had wrote some things here, and I want to see what I have, and it's further down. So a little tidbits to help keep me on course, right? It always helps. You know, Jesus Christ, most amazing. You never read about him having notes, right? In fact, I don't even read of the Apostle Paul having notes. And I know wonderful ministers that minister without notes. I can do it. I like to have some notes, right? It helps me stay on course. Of course, if God leads us into another place, then we want to follow that leading and go there and the notes become... Uh, for file 13, you know what I mean. All right. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 22. I want to remind you, you know, we're going to be specifically, let me capture that. Uh, I think I missed it. Yeah, I, you know, we have had people healed of that specific, uh, specific issue with their eyes. And so, I will, you know, we just thank God for your situation. We thank you for wholeness being manifest in your eyes, that the pressure in your eyeballs balances, becomes perfectly in balance, and that imbalance is changed to the balance that God is just touching you right now. But we're also, we'll be praying for that tomorrow, okay, specifically in our ministry time. So, and that'll be about 8 a.m. tomorrow, central time. Yeah. All right. Now we exhort, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 22, we exhort, brethren, warn them, instruct them that are unruly, they're not walking in the way. So that's my part is to walk in the way, the truth and the life, but I'm also to instruct others, right? I'm not like, well, what are they doing with their life? No, I instruct and share and I help them bearing with one another, which doesn't mean putting up with one another. Some of the, the, the Greek people handle it like bearing with one another in love. Well, I'm just gonna put up with you. That is not the heart of that word. The heart of the word is you supporting me, I'm supporting you. I'm lifting you in the way, you're lifting me in the way. That's the heart of bearing with one another in love. We lift each other into this great high calling of our Father. So, warn them they're unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Those are really having trouble walking the walk. They just can't seem to get into that place where they can stay in the peace and presence of God. We need to comfort them. We need to encourage them. Support the weak. Are there weak people out there? We need to strengthen them, right? Be patient toward all men. Oh, wait a minute. I just, I'm tired. I'm so fed up. Welcome, V-I-K-A, on your first day of Periscope. You know, I... I don't want to put up, they're weak. Uh, I don't want to be patient toward all people because I just don't have any patience. Well, how does the love of God dwell in you if you don't have the fruit of the Spirit patience and you aren't developing the working of God of patience? Because it says only by patient endurance we can enter into the promises and manifest them forth. So if you're not seeing the promises of God master manifesting in your life, Maybe it's because you haven't endured impatiently and seen God come through for you. You just want instant oatmeal, instant microwaves. You want quick answers. And that's people come on the scopes and do that, right? They want a quick answer, but they don't want to enter into the relationship that takes time to develop. Look, none of us were born, even Jesus Christ, and we were 20 years old in a minute, right? Anybody here? Anybody that didn't have to grow in wisdom and knowledge? Jesus Christ says grew in wisdom and knowledge, favor with God, favor with men. We are growing up, and the favor's already poured on us, that great grace and all, but we are growing up in it in our understanding, and as we do, we walk out 
because our capacity is increasing, our heart is enlarging, and now we can give out more of the living lot, rivers of living water that are in us to others. So, see that none render evil for evil unto man, but never follow after that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. And, you know, I'm just sitting here and it's like God is speaking on these things to me and I go, it's, it's going to be too much. <laughs> but I think this is a good one. God shows good, but how often does man return evil for his good? Let's look at this. God has even showed the devil good. He has shown the devil good, but what does he turn? He returns evil. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that's about. So God shows good people, and especially the devil, why do we return evil? So here's the difference between a walking Christian and a defeated Christian. The walking Christian, the attacks of the enemy come, and it's like Plato hitting a wall or something, or a bouncy ball. It hits and it drops. You don't take it in etern internally. The weak Christian who we need to strengthen and comfort and courage, they get hit with an attack and it becomes internal and now they're condemning themselves, they're defeated, they see themselves lacking and they're missing out on the peace and joy of the kingdom. So we need to strengthen them, we need to help them, we need to guard them, we bear up with them and support them in love. But the strong believer, the enemy attacks come and it drops because we're not going to let his lie, we recognize his lie, we're not going to let it come in eternally. So you can show me evil, but I can choose to show you good in evil, in, in, in face of that evil, right? That's what even God has done with the devil. He keeps showing him good, but that wrath is being stored up that the devil is pouring out. And Revelation says it's like that wrath is going to open up and his own wrath, it's really going to be the devil's, what he's poured out is going to consume himself, right? You sow, you reap what you sow. If you give out junk, junk comes back. If you want love, give out love. You want truth, give out truth. You want life, give out life to others. We're giving good in the face of evil. We're becoming the imitators of God, Ephesians 6, 1, be children, be imitators of God, and we're acting like our Father acts like. We're looking like, we start looking like our Lord Jesus Christ, so that when people see us, they see our Lord and Savior, and they see our God. So, thank you for the shares and all on, uh, the, again, shares and hearts and all that. So, Rejoice with evermore. This is my focus of this First Thessalonians 5, 14 through 22. Don't give out evil when evil is given to you. Give out good. That'll tell me if we're a mature believer or we're, we need to grow up. And we all need to grow up in areas, right? We all need to grow up. We don't have it perfectly. God's perfect, but our walk is imperfect. But we're becoming more in the light. We're walking more in the way. And we're more seeing uh, what God has for us. <laughs> You know, it, it isn't me, I tell you. If, if, you, if it was me, pff, fail your... <laughs> but we cannot fail when we look to our gracious and loving Father. So here we go, uh, back in 1 Thessalonians 5. Rejoice evermore. There's a key. How often are you rejoicing? Maybe when you're not sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you kindly. I, I receive that and I release it in multiplication. Whatever you're speaking over me that it is multiplied back to you because God is about increase. Pam, good morning. Uh, the chat's fixed. Uh, <laughs> so pray without ceasing, you know, without quitting. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What's the will of God? Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Rejoice evermore. Just look at your life. Are you always rejoicing? Are you always praying? Are you always giving thanks? Is that your heart attitude or are other things entering in and evil is affecting you and you're actually not walking in the light when you might think you are? Are you being constantly set free from the prisons of your mind in this world or are you being captivated in captivity with them and being held back from your heavenly purpose? So then the next verse, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. How often I have been in churches, and you know what the first thing they do is? They quench the spirit. 
that you do not operate speaking in tongues interpretation here unless you've been on the board or we know you're approved or you're whatever. Well, that's quenching the spirit and that is not the will of God. And unless people have hearts to change, I just might go somewhere else, but I will still speak good. I will still pray for them. I will you know, give thanks for their lives. I'm not going to condemn them. But if the opportunity, God opens an opportunity to come in and minister and teach truth that'll set them free, then you know what? I'm right there. You and I are right there. We're going together. That's all what these broadcasts are about. We're doing this together. If it's about me, let's stop the broadcast. Yeah, there's a face here. There's a personage. There's all this stuff. But it's about you walking forth and who you're created to be and us sharing in this life together. And I so love when you share the things you do with me. Quench not the spirit. Don't water it down. Don't put out the flame. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold according to the word, right? That's how we prove it. The proof is when they tested a metal when, or when they test metals, they test it for purity. This word relates to to the testing of metals and their purity. So it, what we're proving is how pure are we walking in the way, the truth, and the life, our Lord Jesus Christ, and where's the corruption that we need to get rid of, that we need to eliminate, so we walk in his light and glory. Excuse me a minute. Okay, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. If you're holding fast that which is good, you're not letting loose. How often have you, let's, let's think of something here. Maybe you've held on to something and you dropped it. Have you ever held something, a grocery bag or whatever, and you dropped it because you didn't have a good enough grip on it? We cannot afford to do that with the truth of the word of God. We hold fast that which is good, that which is right, that which is just, that which is loving, and so forth. And we abstain from every appearance of evil. In other words, I don't even want to look like evil. There's a section in Ephesians, you know, we don't, we don't want our parents to give off anything evil, which means I can't be thinking evil of a person because sooner or later, if I'm thinking evil about someone, I'm going to say something to somebody. I knew a, an employer I had and he would always go behind people's backs and gossip and say bad things about the person working for him. He wouldn't speak the good. I would just wouldn't hear the good. And you know what that told me? He was doing the same thing about me. He was telling the bad, you know, the one thing I don't like about FC, right? Not the 10 things that actually made it not, you know, whatever, pretty good or something. Have you ever been around it? Have you an employer like that or someone? They're, they, they're speaking the evil, not the good. That is not good overcoming evil. That's letting evil walk in evil, okay? Uh, so abstain from all appearance of evil. And I mentioned in Ephesians, it says not to have a hint. I don't remember the word, but it's like lust. Not to even have a hint. There should be nothing in my life that looks like, okay, speaking as a man, she's hot. She's got something. Check out her bod, legs. What you know what I'm saying, right? There should be nothing like that where I'm hinting. I've got a, I've got an awesome, beautiful wife. I'm so thankful for her, right? And many of us are married and have wives, husbands. Are we so thankful for them that we keep our mind on track, or are we easily distracted by the evil that comes in and we see something that looks good and we're like, I want that. Hey, that's Samson, right? Samson and Delilah. He really missed it in that area, and because of it, it cost him his life. If you are so drawn to the enemy's call, his evil call, to lust and things like that, it will destroy your life. You will pay a high price that is not worth paying. When the great glory call or the price of Jesus Christ has come, and we're like, beholding his glory, it says, behold, uh, the beauty of holiness, the beauty of his holiness, the world's beauty, it doesn't, it's like an out candle. It isn't even lit and his glory is shining forth. So the second uh, thing uh, is about the free movement of God's word. So we've kind of covered a section here, which um, did I kind of title it or not? So like, what are we following after? Revival begins with the individual. So the second part I want to go into is, yeah, and I've gone long already. It's a good thing I, did, I made this into two parts. 
because I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Free course. The movement of the word of God having free course. Revival. This is the heart of revival. Second, Th 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 Second Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. Finally, brethren, pray for us. You know what? We're never so good. We don't need people to pray for us. You and I, I need your prayers. I need them. I, I even might say I desperately need them. I'm so thankful for your prayers. Even if it's for two seconds, thank you for that dude on the scope. I thank God for that. I thank God on every remembrance of you when he brings you to mind. And if I pray for you for 15 seconds, a minute, whatever it might be, five seconds, I thank God for your life and that reminder of who you are. Randy Cooper, good morning. Our Randy Cooper. So, Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for all, thank you, for all men do not have the faith, right? Live life, live love, right? <laughs> all men don't have the faith. All men and women, right? They don't have the faith. We, are we to be unequally yoked with those unbelievers? We become like them. Evil manners, evil words, evil actions corrupt people. I, you and I have seen time after time, if we've lived any length of time, that a believer walking in the light goes to a secular college or gets involved with secular people and they get talked out of the truth. They listen to more to what the world has to say than what God has declared who and what they are, and then their lives are defeated, and you see them living a life of mediocrity. They're living a life on the misty plains, and when they could be having a mountaintop experience with their father amidst the troubles and trials of life. So all don't have the faith. We're praying that we may be each delivered, you and I, from wicked and evil men. And we get some on here, right? We get some trolls and things that come in and do their little attacks, mess around. You know, we just need to keep looking to God because that's part of life. So when we have this confidence, oh, but the Lord is faithful. Look where the Lord is faithful. Look, God's going to speak something here that is going to break something off you and I today. He's about ready to speak. It's been spoken from long ago, but it's just as true today because the word is just alive and vital today as it was then. The Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. What? He is going to establish you. And when you're established, the earthquakes come, the hurricanes come, you're still standing. There's an account of a, a, a gentleman that we are working with that when a recent hurricane happened this last year, that he just gave his place in Southern Florida to God. The hurricane came and it stalled. It stayed there a couple days beating the coastline, beating the coastline. And there all these uh, condos and buildings were flooded with water. On the left of his building, they were flooded for a ways. On the right of his building, they were flooded for a ways. His building was untouched in the middle of those storms and pounding waves. Talk about something amazing. That is our God. But we live in this evil world, a present evil world, Galatians 1, 4. And so God says, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you. That means he's going to strengthen you, comfort, put you in a place that you're protected, even in the midst of the evil around you. And he's going to guard you. It means, I don't remember this word, I didn't look it up, but it, it, as I understand it, it means like a spiritual military guards, like Psalm 91, that God is going to put angels around you to protect you from the evil one. Do the attacks still come? But because of it, yes, but because of his protection, they don't have to change your course or direction of life. Was Jesus Christ attacked? Incredibly so. We, I don't know a believer that has had gone through all the attacks that Jesus did. It says he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. That's because he had God's protection. He had his watchful care. Do you and I have his watchful care? Do we know his presence so well that when it looks the darkest of the night, that we know he's there with us? Do we know it? And that's why... We behold each other in the presence of our God. We pray for one another. We encourage one another. We comfort one another with our Father's great truth. Excuse me a minute.
<clears throat> so, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. I tell you, if he wasn't guarding us, the attacks would be a thousand times stronger. And as I heard long ago, we'd probably be like a grease spot by midnight. We would be wiped out. But God is watching over us through his son and even his angels. So we have this confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts. That's what he does. The great work of the Spirit of God is to direct our hearts into the love of God and to the steadfastness, the faithfulness, the assurance of Christ. I want to look at two words here because we're considering revival. And I said this was going to be different today. We weren't going through Acts and all that. It says in that first verse, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and have free course, uh, be honored. King James says that the word of the Lord may have free course. This word, speed ahead, which is free course, um, is used um, of the doctrine of the truth, the truth of the word, that it rapidly propagates. There are plants that you can plant. There are certain, like weeds sometimes, or ground clover, and a few years, what has gone from a little clump, you know, I think lilies do this, right? They just spread forth. The word of the Lord is to be, we're to be so planted in our Father and His word and His truth that the word of the Lord rapidly goes forth. It isn't the same year after year, day after day. If you're in a church, if you're in a fellowship, and it's been five years, and it looks the same today as yesterday, something is wrong and the key is the word has not become living and real to the individual we're living off somebody else's word and not his word living in us used metaphorically and that means figuratively it's used of runners in a race this free course this speeding ahead the word of the lord speeding ahead <clears throat> it's to exert oneself to strive toward a goal that god would have for us to to live for it's to spend one's strength and ability in attaining something, attaining the re outreach, the reach out of the word into people's hearts and lives that set them free. We can sit and watch TV all day, but how much have hearts been changed from an impact in a, by how our lives are affected, or are our, our lives affected enough by our Father that we affect our world, or are we just floating along in the misty flats? So... This word, uh, <clears throat> this word in Greek writings, now not necessarily the Bible, yeah, no TV, in, 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 in Greek, and we, we watched a movie the other night, uh, let's see, Machine Gun, the Machine Gun Preacher, Machine Gun Preacher, that guy, it's on like, I don't know, it's out there, Machine Gun Preacher, it's a true story of Sham, Sam Childers, he's kind of like uh, David Hogan or whatever. He just doesn't take any C-R-A-P. Don't want to say the word. You know what I'm talking about. All right, I think you do. So this word of, of speeding ahead and a free course in Greek writings, it was denoting that in, in enduring and going through extreme peril, but it, it requires the exertion of all one's effort to overcome. Now, Christ overcame, right? And through him, we are overcomers, well, right? We always causes us to triumph in Christ. Nay, in all these things, no, we are more, Romans 8, 31 or somewhere down there, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. When we know the love, we walk in the love, we rise above the hate and the evil of the world. When we don't know who we are, we aren't receiving that love, we go through the pressures of life and we're crushed. Remember the soils in the Gospels, the good ground, the stony ground, the uh, you know the wayside, and so forth. Do the cares and concerns of this world crush the word? Because we're more concerned how we look to others and what we have to show off than living a Holy Spirit-filled life. So I want to finish this, but. <laughs> Oh man, there's so much here. The word honor, the word honor. So speed forth and be honored. The word be honored. So a revival with us to our world. It means to extol, to magnify, to clothe with splendor, therefore imparting glory. 
that we are so clothed with the splendor of our Father's Word and the Holy Spirit that we impart glory wherever we go. Could that be said of your life? Could it be said of your life that as you go forth, you impart glory to others? And that, know what that means? When you impart glory to others, it means rendering them excellent. You prepare a meal. There's a process. Certain meals take more time. But you want to render, you want to bring forth something that is pleasant, enjoyable, and a blessing to those you're giving it to. So, therefore, in honoring the word of the Lord, we are clothed with the splendor of his word. We impart the glory of his word to others, and we bring others to a place of excellence. It's to make renowned. It's caused the dignity and worth of the word to become the dignity and worth of the individual to be manifested, and then we acknowledge what's living in each other. You might want to go back and listen to that again. It's speaking life to your heart and breaking captivity right now. So remember, uh, Paul said this in Philippians 3.8, Indeed, I count everything as loss, not of any value because of the surpassing worth, the great incredible worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And the King James says, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, trash, garbage, or dung, some translations, in order that I may gain, win, or walk with Christ. Are the values of things in the world that you're hanging on to causing you to have loss in Christ instead of losing those things to walk in the fullness of Christ. What are you hanging on to that is rubbish that needs to be eliminated so you rise up in the high calling you're called to be? You know, this has been a long broadcast and I don't like to go this long, but people have things to do, people go out, but other people come in for a minute and they miss the meat that causes something in their system that brings the release of the kingdom. Yeah, my appointment's here. I like, you signed up for an appointment and you're here. It, is, it isn't me. Look, those of you that know close to me is like, FC, it's like Paul. What did it say about Paul? His letters are strong, but his bodily presence is weak. You would probably find me like that. You'd go, man, he does a pretty good broadcast sometimes, but being around him, he's kind of like normal dude or something. It's long but powerful. Thanks, Charlotte. So I do want to wind this up. Uh, the surpassing worth of knowing, experiencing. This isn't knowing, just understanding. Experiencing a relationship with our God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is it far more valuable than the things of earth that you're holding on to that are temporary, that are fading, that are dissipating, you know, corrupting. So in this context, what has the gospel cost you and I? Very little but it cost God his son, that sacrifice for us. What have we sacrificed for the gospel for what God has done for us? A sacrifice, remember Romans 12, 1, we're to be living sacrifices and we're closing out. So a live, we're to be living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is a sacrifice that has died that lives. Kind of different, right? You think of sacrifice, something that died. Because we die to something, we die to self, that his life comes forth in us, through us. So to be a living sacrifice, the sacrifice in the physical sense is laid upon the altar, Christ on the cross in, in the example we think of. Uh, and it says we're to take our cross up daily. We were crucified with Christ, right? So if sacrifice is laid upon the altar in the Old Testament. Now, what is the evidence of God's accepting the sacrifice? So I'm, gonna, I'm asking that as a question. Yes, Beverly Sue, you're so welcome. We are valuing how our Father has valued us above all the values that the world would place on us, which are really nothing in comparison to him. So what indicates that the sacrifice was acceptable to God in the Old Testament? So I'm going to wait a few more seconds for that, see if somebody has it. Anybody? <laughs> Joy of the Lord is my strength. Nobody's got it. Okay, or somebody's got it and they're not putting it in. It was the fire. The fire would come down. Remember Elijah, Elisha, and the prophets and all that? And he put water on the sacrifice and all that. 
Um, yes, Amy, together we are walking into greatness with Father. We're receiving reproof correction. Okay, you jumped ahead on me. Uh, you jumped ahead on me. So, whoops, let's, let's just go here, here, there. Goodbye. All right. When the sacrifice was done and in the proper, the fire from God would, yes, it would, the sacrifice was acceptable. On the day of Pentecost, the phenomenon of the cloven tongues of fire, and they spoke with tongues, that cloven tongues of fire was indicating that their lives were now acceptable to the Father because of the sacrifice of his son. His sacrifice was his life. Our sacrifice is to give our life in service to live for him and watch what he does. And I'm telling you, it's the most incredible life that you could ever envision or have. So as we lay our lives on the altar of the Lord and of our God, we find the fullness of his life comes forth. When we are fully given to the plans and purposes of our God, Javon, I think, Javon, good morning, Jake. So when we are fully given to the plans and purposes of God, as they were on the day of Pentecost, fully committed to him, the fire of the spirit comes forth, the purification comes, and now we can rise up in the goodness and the love and the truth of we are created to be enjoying the righteousness, peace, and joy of the kingdom. And I said the other day, because some people I know in different parts, is if doubt, worries, and fears are beating you up, it's because you're not properly using your shield of faith. Your shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, which are primarily, or the majority of them, are in doubt, worry, and fear. Let's learn how to use our shield Let's let the word become living and vital, real to us. And let's live forth, forth the magnificent life of the God in Christ in us.